Good morning, everyone. Welcome in um, for part two of our D-Day exploration, our student field trip about D-Day. So my name is Kate. If you were here yesterday, welcome back. If not, welcome. I am an educator at the National World War II Museum, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit more about D-Day. But this is part two of a two-part series where we learn about D-Day in an interactive way. So yesterday, we started learning about why New Orleans and why the museum is located in New Orleans, and we became generals. So you'll hear me today reference not students, but generals, because that's the role that you guys are playing. And we made our first decision yesterday. So if you haven't watched yesterday's, it is on our YouTube, and you can watch it, and you can pause it, you can make the decisions, um, and then you can do this one as part two. So we're gonna jump right back in. Um, if you're using the chat, make sure to be appropriate, but we want you to use the chat to discuss the decisions that we are doing together. But you can also just turn to the person next to you and talk about them. I'll pause when we're making decisions. And if you don't have anybody with you, you can talk to your dog, your cat, or just yourself even to discuss these decisions. So we made one decision yesterday, and it was where we were going to invade. Well, generals, remember we chose option number three, which was indeed Normandy, so the actual beaches, we made the right decision. But we have some more options to choose from. And then we are going to watch a little bit of our D-Day electronic field trip. The whole field trip is on our YouTube page as well. It's about an hour long if you're interested in a little bit more in depth about D-Day with some more video, check that out. And then we'll take some Q&A. So without further ado, generals, let's hop right back in there. And I'm really glad that you are here today with us. So if you remember yesterday, we started with our museum because our museum started not as the National World War II Museum, but as the D-Day Museum. And we made our first decision. So now we move to decision two, when to invade. And if you remember from yesterday, we talked a little bit about the tides. And so we are going to move back and talk a little bit more about the tides. So we've decided generals to invade along the beaches in Normandy. Now we have to decide, are we going to invade at high tide or low tide? So I'm going to give you the advantages and disadvantages of each, and then we'll pause, and you can type in the chat what your decision is, or again, turn to your neighbor or anyone in the room with you to discuss it. And when you're discussing your decision, remember to explain why and how you came to that. So we are going to use cross-section of Omaha Beach, and I hope you like my uh, PowerPoint graphics, we're throwing it back a little bit here, um, as our example. So let's talk about low tide. So advantages of low tide, sending our Higgins boat. As you can see here, our boat stops before we get to all of those Atlantic wall obstacles that we talked about yesterday that you can see here on your screen. Those stakes, those ramps, those hedgehogs. So it's a big advantage because our boats don't have to go over them, much less likely to sink. But disadvantage, as you can see, once those soldiers get out of the back of those Higgins boats, they're going to have to run about 400 yards under heavy fire to get to the cover of the sea wall. So there is a fair amount of time to be running under heavy fire and you could lose a lot of soldiers that way. So that's definitely a disadvantage of coming in at low tide. Okay, now let's talk about high tide generals. So advantages of coming in 
Mai Tai. You can see how close our LCVP or Higgins boat, made right here in New Orleans, gets to that sea wall. So once soldiers get out of that boat, they're very close to the cover of that sea wall. But clearly there are some disadvantage and you can see here that with coming in at high tide, our boats do have to go over and navigate those ramps, those stakes, all of those obstacles. So generals, this was a real decision that had to be made and the planning of D-Day or Operation Overlord. And so right now, if you're watching this as a recording, I want you to pause and talk about it. And so I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds right now to decide, are we invading at low tide or high tide? A lot of good discussion and answers come in. Yep, make sure to explain why you're choosing low or high tide. Hmm. Well, generals, looks like some of you got it right. And this was actually a decision that was made by Eisenhower, the general in charge of all the other generals, or our supreme allied commander. And Eisenhower chose to attack at low tide. He hoped that our naval bombardment, so the days leading up to D-Day, we were bombarding the Atlantic coast and all the Atlantic wall obstacles, and he hoped that that bombardment of German defenses would kill most of the German soldiers before our allied troops landed. So that crossing that large beach or that 400 yards wouldn't be a problem. And so he chose low tide. Now we'll learn a little bit later on how that naval bombardment didn't go quite as planned. And so when we do invade, we do have soldiers running those 400 yards It's a pretty heavy fire. So nice job on that decision, but we're not finished yet. So, part two deals actually with moonlight. So we call this to moon or not to moon. So we've decided to attack the beaches of Normandy. Generals, you've decided that. And we've decided to attack at low tide. But we also have to decide how we want to begin that attack. And so if you remember, you can pause here to talk about it. Do you remember anything about paratroopers or what the job of the paratroopers were on that day or maybe even, you know, a little bit before? Yeah, exactly. So our paratroopers will be dropping out of airplanes over Normandy just about midnight or so to prepare the way for the soldiers landing that next morning. And their mission, which is very essential, is capturing roads and bridges to prevent more Nazi soldiers from coming into the area, right? So reinforcements. So generals, we have to decide should we launch our attack on a night with full moonlight or an attack with almost no moonlight? So again, I'm gonna talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each. Then we'll pause and you guys can discuss which one you're gonna go with. So what would be an advantage of attacking on a night with moonlight? So advantages of a night with full moonlight. Paratroopers, so the troops jumping out of airplanes, can see the ground below. France, where they're jumping into, is a foreign country to all of them. So having the light of flight um, and their targeted zone, you know, in a lighter manner will, will really help. It's easier to see. So disadvantages though, if our allies can see each other when they're jumping out of the plane, 
the Germans most likely will be able to see them as well with the light of moon. So they don't really have the cover of darkness. Now, let's talk about a night with almost no moonlight. So advantages of a night with almost no moonlight, well, it's really the cover of darkness, right? Germans below can't see them because of how dark it is. Disadvantages though, with no light, drops can be really scattered. They won't be able to see where they're landing or even if it's near their target once they get to the ground. And if they're too scattered once they reach the ground, the paratroopers may not be able to meet up with one another and achieve their mission because it's so dark. So again, generals, you have a tough decision, just as the real generals did. Do you send your paratroopers on a moonlit night or a night with almost no moon? So pause here to discuss. And if you're in the chat, make sure to explain why you're choosing what you are choosing. So to moon or not to moon. Nice to see some familiar names from yesterday. Welcome back, welcome back. Also some new names, glad you guys have joined us today. Lots of good decisions. Oh, seeing some, seeing some correct answers. Some of you guys seem to know a little bit more about D-Day than you let on. So Eisenhower, again, Supreme Allied Commander, and his advisors decided to attack on a night with as much moonlight as possible. So the soldiers and the paratroopers could see what they were doing. It's actually the riskier of the two options, but it was a risk that Eisenhower was willing to take. So this is when Eisenhower and the advisors turned to James Stagg, right, the weatherman, and they looked at the sun and moonlight table, and they basically scoured May and June for nights that had a full moon. So basically looking for a big circle. And they found a series of three days in June. Some of you may know some of those days. June 5th, 6th, and 7th looked like they were gonna have full moons. And so Eisenhower says, okay, June 5th it is, 1944, we're going to launch Operation Overlord. We've made our decisions, generals, we've trained our troops, it's been years in the making, and we've gathered our supplies. The only thing left to do is launch the attack. And so as we just decided, D-Day is going to be launched on June 5th, the first night with a full moon. But, does anybody know what happened? Because our museum, the D-Day Museum, opened on June 6th of 2000, which is the anniversary of D-Day. So it happened actually a day later. Oh, yep. There's one thing that even Eisenhower himself cannot control, and that is the weather. And bad weather in the English Channel delayed the invasion one day. And this is a cool photo, a really famous photo. General Eisenhower goes down to give a pep talk to some of the paratroopers in the 101st Airborne Division. Um, and a lot of people think that he is giving just a pep talk and he's raising his hand, but he's actually talking about fly fishing in this picture, which is really, really cool. But June 6th rolls along and he makes the famous words, okay, let's go. Now, Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander couldn't talk to every soldier that night, right? There are tens of thousands of Allied soldiers taking part in this mission. So he typed out and recorded a speech rallying his troops, right? Think about like if you had a coach who was rallying the players the day before a big match or something like that. And so Eisenhower in this speech, this is a primary source copy of this speech, sounds really, really positive. And lo and behold, even Eisenhower himself was not confident that this undertaking, this amphibious invasion with 
tens of thousands of troops that had never been done before on a heavily fortified beach was going to work. And we can prove that Eisenhower was a little bit apprehensive and nervous because he prepared a brief note to read just in case the operation was a failure. And actually, if I take this away, you can see he dated it July 5th, when it really he wrote this June 5th. And he's saying, this didn't go well. Any blame or fault is mine and mine alone. And of course, now hindsight's 2020. We know that this note was not needed, um, but we do have it here in our museum. And I think it's a really cool primary source to study um, D-Day with. But even though Eisenhower wasn't sure this was going to work, he had faith. And so on June 6th at about midnight, paratroopers boarded their planes, C-47s. We have one at our museum if you've been there or if you are planning to visit one day to head across the channel. The uh, two groups, the 82nd Airborne Division and the 101st Airborne Division headed over there. Around 20,000 paratroopers and glider troops land behind enemy lines from about midnight to 3 a.m. And meanwhile, more than 150,000 soldiers tightly packed on hundreds of troop transport ships steam across the English Channel under the cover of night. And about 4 a.m., they board those Higgins boats that we talked about yesterday that you guys, you generals, decided to use. The seas were still a little rocky because of the bad weather the day before. And some men actually do get sick as they climb down the rope ladders. About 36 men to a boat, piloted by both Navy and Coast Guard. And then at 6.30 a.m. on June 6th of 1944, the invasion roughly begins at 6.30 a.m. And generals, we're going to head to a clip from our D-Day EFT to wrap up our decision making. In the last segment, we reviewed the fierce fighting that took place on the D-Day beaches and the sacrifices of the Allied forces invading this region. In addition to the casualties on both sides of the conflict, the war ravaged civilian population caught in the crossfire. I am now at the Civilians in Wartime Memorial Museum in Falaise, France. This is a unique museum dedicated to the lives of regular people as their world is appended by war and conflict. Towns were bombarded before and after the invasion. Civilians tried to find protection and safety underground, with many losing their homes or even entire towns. In the Battle for Normandy alone, 20,000 victims lost their lives and thousands more will become war refugees. Le mémorial des civils dans la guerre a été construit sur une maison en ruine qui a été bombardée en 1944. Je suis maintenant avec Emmanuel Thiebaud du musée qui va nous parler un peu de cette maison. Donc euh, qu'est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire sur cette maison en particulier Alors en fait c'est une maison qui a été découverte lorsque le mémorial a été construit il y a maintenant plus de trois ans. Nous avons euh, agrandi euh, par rapport au bâtiment existant euh, pour faire un bâtiment nouveau et en faisant les travaux nous avons découvert ce que nous voyons sous nos pieds, c'est-à-dire les vestiges de l'ancienne maison qui existait ici à cet emplacement pendant la seconde guerre mondiale et qui a été détruite en 1944. C'est une maison qui a appartenu euh, au début du XXe siècle à un monsieur qui était très connu à Falaise, qui était un docteur, le docteur Turgis, et la maison euh, a gardé ce nom d'ailleurs de maison Turgis pour la désigner tant euh, elle était imposante dans la ville. On n'est pas très loin de l'hôtel de ville, on est vraiment sur la place centrale de Falaise et au cours de l'été 1944, eh bien, pendant les bombardements, cette maison a été complètement anéantie et détruite. Et après guerre, plutôt que de reconstruire la maison à l'identique, eh bien, la municipalité de Falaise a fait le choix de reconstruire un autre bâtiment 
qui complétait la mairie, un autre bâtiment administratif, puisque en fait, le bâtiment dans lequel aujourd'hui nous nous trouvons, qui est devenu le mémorial des civils dans la guerre, est l'ancien tribunal administratif de Falaise. Euh, – Donc quand vous nous parlez de ça, on pense évidemment à la situation des civils, donc comment est-ce qu'ils s'en sont sortis durant l'occupation ?– Alors en fait, euh, l'occupation était évidemment très dure pour les populations civiles, il ne faut pas oublier en fait un fait très principal, c'est que les Allemands en occupant la France occupent un pays riche, et ouais. ce qui va importer pendant 4 ans aux Français, c'est le pillage économique du pays. Qui dit pillage économique du pays à leur profit, au profit de l'effort de guerre allemand, signifie qu'il reste de moins en moins de choses, de matières premières à redistribuer au reste de la population. Si bien que pendant 4 ans, et très rapidement dès l'automne 1940, la population se trouve soumise à toute une série de pénuries, restrictions, ravitaillements qui ne s'arrêteront jamais pendant toute la période de la guerre. Il va devenir très difficile de se nourrir, de se vêtir, de se déplacer et... Ajoutez à cela que toutes vos libertés individuelles et collectives par la pression de toutes les lois et ordonnances allemandes mais aussi du gouvernement de Vichy qui va aussi contraindre la population fait que, au final, en résumé, on pourrait dire que pendant 4 ans, la population française s'est trouvée dans une prison à ciel ouvert. – D'accord, donc on imagine qu'ils étaient sous tension. Et quelle a été euh, la réaction des civils quand ils ont vu les alliés débarquer Est-ce qu'ils s'entendaient avec ou est-ce que c'était plutôt tendu ?– On le voit dans les archives, il y a des militaires des fois euh, qui écrivent dans leur rapport euh, « on est venu libérer les Français euh, mais on ne se sent pas accueilli à bras ouverts ». Alors il est vrai que lorsque vous avez perdu tous vos biens, eh bien, vous êtes à la fois évidemment content que l'occupation allemande cesse, mais triste parce que eh bien, euh, vous allez avoir du temps à vous redresser et à, vous, euh, à reprendre une vie normale. – D'accord, et donc on imagine que les civils ont, ont mis du temps à s'en remettre, donc quelles ont été euh, leurs premières réactions et leurs premiers souvenirs à l'évocation des, des campagnes normandes – Alors en fait, euh, ce qui est très intéressant et important aussi à signaler, c'est de s'apercevoir que euh, les civils qui ont été, on le comprend bien aussi, les grandes victimes de cette Seconde Guerre mondiale, rappelons qu'il y a eu plus, pour la première fois dans un conflit de l'histoire, plus de morts civiles que de militaires, et malgré tout, dans toutes les commémorations qui avaient lieu après-guerre, eh bien c'était plutôt le fait militaire qui était commémoré et les civils qui étaient un petit peu les oubliés de cette histoire, de cette commémoration et de cette libération. Et il faut attendre les années 80-80, pour que enfin réapparaisse la mémoire de ces populations civiles, des souffrances qu'ils avaient endurées pendant ces combats de la libération. Et c'est à ce moment-là que la parole va se libérer, qu'on va entendre les civils qui vont aussi avoir quelque chose à nous raconter, un témoignage à nous porter et une autre expérience de la guerre euh, à nous permettre de découvrir. – Merci pour votre temps et merci, merci de nous avoir accueillis dans votre musée. – Merci bien. – Je vais maintenant aller rejoindre les autres reporters au cimetière américain de Colville. Today we're at the Normandy American Cemetery, Visitor Center and Memorial. This place, which looks out to Omaha Beach, serves as a reminder for the cost of D-Day and all of World War II. Over one million visitors from across the globe travel to this place every year. It was the first American cemetery on European soil in World War II. Over 9,000 individuals are remembered here by these beautifully kept graves of those who lost their lives in the Battle of Normandy. Here we also have the walls of the missing for those who have perished, but their remains have not been recovered. The rosettes marking some of these names indicate those who have been officially identified. We were at the grave of Private First Class Jack Powers, one of thousands of Americans who lost their lives in the battle for Normandy. Jack, along with his older brother Clyde, stormed Omaha with Company A of the 116th Infantry Regiment. Both were residents of Bedford, Virginia, with roughly 30 other men who participated in Operation Overlord. As the day closed on June the 6th, 1944, 19 men from Bedford, Virginia lost their lives. In the small town of 3,200, it was a devastating loss of life. In fact, it was actually the largest loss of life per capita in any American town. The Powers were one set of free group of brothers from Bedford who were sent to the shore in the first wave of D-Day. These men weren't the only group of brothers to storm these shores. George, Albert and Thomas Westlake from Toronto were killed within only four days of each other and are buried together in the Bernie sur mer Cemetery behind Juno Beach. Jack enjoyed singing, dancing the jitterbug and playing his guitar. 
On D-Day, fellow veterans recall that the usually calm Jack was tense as he boarded the landing craft to get him to shore. Eyewitnesses say that he died instantly on the beach. His brother returned back home to Bedford with intense sadness and guilt without Jack by his side. Today we remember Jack, the Bedford boys, and thousands of other Allied troops who lost their lives in the Battle of Normandy. Today we remember them and let them rest in peace. I, I couldn't say in what way it was positive, except that I know that I wasn't the same bod coming out as I was going in. I didn't look at things the same way. I didn't feel things in the same way. But why that was, I don't know. It's strange. I've often wondered about that. But I suppose if you see violent death, enough times you get used to it that must be it because otherwise it'd drive you mad you know there are none of our boys alive now but well i miss them but i feel grateful that i've lived so long really and it'd be nice to be able to get together with them again I hope I go to heaven and that I'll, I'll, I'll meet them there. They were, they were courageous and, and kind and caring. Uh, <clears throat> being a loyal Texan and American, uh, it just uh, was my duty to defend my country and fight for my country. Uh, people have asked me, well, over the years, uh, Frank, did you fight for apple pie and, and uh, uh, mom's uh, cooking? And uh, actually, when you become a combat soldier, you fight for your buddies. And you fight for the guys that you are in the same unit with, and you fight for each other, and you fight for your objective. So. I, I know that I'm a very patriotic person. Uh, I love my country, I love my state, I love the opportunities that it affords the people of our country. And one of the core values that I have and always will have is the freedom that our country provides our people. Thank you all for participating in our interactive D-Day field trip. You guys did a great job in the discussion and to helping me decide our D-Day um, decisions. So if you are interested in seeing more of that electronic field trip, we've been putting the entire link that we have on YouTube in the chat. You can see more oral histories and you'll notice they're not just American oral histories. We have them from British and Canadian soldiers as well, and more footage from Normandy herself. And I did see a question on there asked by Anonymous, asking why didn't Eisenhower have the other generals also give pep talks? And the answer is that he did. He was just the Supreme Allied Commander, and so he is the one who recorded a speech that was played to all 100, really 75,000 soldiers from all the different countries, American, Canadian, and Great British, um, and Great Britain. And the other generals involved, they did give, you know, pep talks, but just not um, a huge recording that was broadcast to everyone involved. But thank you again for joining us today on this Friday. And we hope that we will see you back next week. We go live every day at 11 Central. Um, if you are interested, this is going to be recorded and put on our YouTube. If you are interested in yesterday's program, it is on YouTube as well. And any other day that we go live, we record them and put them on YouTube. 
Next week, just like this week, the programs will all be delivered um, on a Zoom webinar format. So thank you all for attending and I hope you have a great rest of your day and weekend. Happy Friday.